Good morning and welcome to the Mid-Main Chamber of Commerce and Thomas College Business Breakfast Series. My name is Kim Linloff. I'm the President and CEO of the Mid-Main Chamber of Commerce and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Okay, our speaker today is Mark Pittman. This may help you recognize him. Mark is an international leadership coach and fundraising trainer, um, helping nonprofit boards and staff get excited about asking for money. He's the author of Ask Without Fear the found, and the founder of fundraisingcoach.com um, the, the, and the executive director of the affordable fundraising training program, the Nonprofit Academy. Just about the only thing Mark loves more than asking for money is training board members and normal people to ask. <laughs> because of his dynamic trainings, he speaks to thousands each year at events like the World Fundraising Summit in Mexico, trainings in New Zealand, Association for Fundraising Professional International Conference, and organizations around the world, even groups like the International Bowling Expo. His experience in nonprofit fundraising and leadership training, as well as his balanced commentary, have caused him to be featured in books and articles around the world and be sought out as a guest on TV, radio, and print as diverse as Al Jazeera, Success Magazine, and Fox News. With a passion that's made people call him the Johnny Appleseed of fundraising, <laughs> Mark is committed to making it ridiculously easy for board members, volunteers, and nonprofit staff to get fundraising training. Ask Without Fear has been translated into Dutch, Polish, Spanish, and Chinese. And he continues to write books, create fundraising training DVDs, and collaborate on systems like 100 Donors in 90 Days. His leadership and experience also includes planting and pastoring a vineyard church, managing a gubernatorial campaign, teaching internet marketing at both the undergrad and grad level, and being chosen as one of Maine's first 40 under 40, honoring Maine's emerging generation of leaders. Mark's also selling his book over here afterwards if you'd like a copy. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mark Pittman. Well, thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. Looks good. <laughs> Do this too. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, it's a gr pr real privilege to be here because as she was saying some of those things, like the, the vineyard church that I pastored was right here in Waterville. And the gubernatorial campaign was for Peter Mills uh, right here in Maine. So there's just a lot of rich history that I have here, but I don't get to talk to you guys that much. Uh, I was telling some people at the table over there that Ask Without Fear was written for Mainers. I had done fundraising for about in New York and in Boston and came back to Maine and just, I think fundraising is the coolest thing in the world. It's the best gig we could ever have. But not everybody feels that way. It was kind of shocking to me. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. And then I came here and I had had many, many capital campaigns experience, raised millions of dollars. And what I found in Maine was so impressive. There were so many nonprofits. It was in the Lewiston area that I first moved back to where I did most of my growing up. Um, and there are so many nonprofits that were volunteer run. Then if they just had a little bit of help with their fundraising, they could do so much more good in the world. So that's where I created Ask Without Fear, which you're gonna get a part of, uh, kind of synopsis of a little bit later in the talk today. But that was written for board members, for people that didn't, that didn't get paid by the organization. It turns out staff members like it too, but um, it was inspired by people like you. So it's a real privilege to be able to get back to that today. We, how many of you think that fundraising is a huge privilege? Okay, but, oh, yeah, all right. So they're gonna have a little, no, we don't, I don't, I don't want you to lie, <laughs> so that's good. Honesty and integrity are the best fundraising tools that we have in our toolkit. So um, how many, just to get a sense from the crowd, um, and I'm sorry for those on camera, but how many of you get a paycheck from a nonprofit? How many of you work for, uh, your, work for yourself and feel like you are a nonprofit? <laughs> no, you don't have to. Okay, some people are saying that. Okay, great. And how many of you volunteer for a nonprofit? Awesome. Okay, so this is this is super. What you get to do, all nonprofits, as far as I've been around the world, most everything that I've seen for nonprofits, and one of the commonalities is they need funding. And what we get to do, I was talking to someone before, as a fundraiser, what your, your opportunity is to be like a Yenta. You're like Yenta the matchmaker for donors. We often think it's about us. We have to get all of our paperwork in order. We have to get all of our marketing in order. We have to get our website looking perfect. We have to get, and those are all good things. But really what fundraising is about, if we were to distill this and leave and, and you know, a quarter after, is that it's about taking a donor and taking your organization's impact and wedding them together. 
and gets ta stepping back and getting out of the picture. Because the donors, most donors, this is why I think fundraising is a huge privilege. Most of us, when we go to school, we have dreams and aspirations. And so many of us go to college and we have these, these just desires and values and we're gonna set the world on fire. And then we get working and we pay off our loans or we get married and we start having, it just, stop, life happens. And so we start working 40, 60, 80 hours a week. And a lot of those values that we held dear just kind of get left by, by, by and by. You know, you see this with marriages too. Marriages get together and, and you, you look at the starry-eyed couple. I'm, my wife and I are approaching our 20th anniversary in May, um, which we're way too young to have been married that long. We're not sure how that happened. And we're way too young to have a kid that just signed up for driver's ed. That's like bizarre. But, um, but you see this where the starry-eyed, they, we're going to love each other. It's going to be just all you know, unicorns and rainbows. And it's not. Life happens. What we get to do as fundraisers is take those values that people thought that they were, were important to them and bring those values back. That desire for community, that desire for making a difference in the world, feeding people, um, conserving land, whatever it is your cause is, bringing live entertainment and art to people. We get to bring those, wed those together. We get to tell people that that's 40, 60, 80 hours a week that they're doing, putting into their work that actually has meaning to it. So for us, it's like this, this hand here. We get to, the donor is the electrical cord and our nonprofit is this strip of outlets. And if some of them are two prong, some are two prong with the fat edge, some are three prong, some are, some are the appliance ones that we used to have with the curvy edge. Uh, some are like in New Zealand with a Christmas tree. And what we get to do with the donors, walk up and down our wall of our nonprofit and find out what aspect of our nonprofit is the best plug, the best match for them. Have you ever tried, we live in central Maine, have you ever had one of those houses that have the two prongs without the fat side? Yeah. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you take the fat side, the, the two prongs with the fat side plug and you try to shove it into the old 1950s wall outlet, what happens? <laughs> it doesn't work, right? Until you just keep pushing it in. But we do this with donors all the time. We get whatever our cause is, we get this is our, this is our thing that we're doing. Let's, let's just talk about it if we have an annual fund. We'll use that term. We have this annual fund that you need to give to, this monthly donor program. And the donor's over here saying, I want to give to this thing over here, and it's totally in your mission, but you're not hearing it, and you're trying to shove them into this square peg in a round hole sort of thing. What, what good fundraising is, is listening to the donor and finding out where their interests match with your organization. It's sort of like our nonprofits are a gem. And what we get to do is introduce them, introduce donors to the facet of our nonprofit that is the most likely fit for them. What we tend to get wrong is we want everybody to understand everything about us. We want them to see the whole gem. We want them to be totally converted to our cause and then we'll accept their money. When in reality, all we want really, all we need is the first step of a commitment. And it could be just that signing a check or volunteering some time. Because Ask Without Fear can be about volunteering. It can be anything for making your fundraising the best this year. All right. I'm so excited already. So I'm gonna, but I'm, I've got slides that I'm gonna give you. Um, and I just blacked out the screen, check that out. Okay, the other thing is, you've already noticed this about me. I, I've been told I speak at about 400 words a minute with gusts up to 600. Uh, so, um, I, and I'm wanting to pack a lot into the short time that we have together because I found out just a few minutes ago that we're not here till five. I'm just, no, I knew that. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to, all the slides, I don't protect the slides. I want to give them to you so you can share them with your team, your board, whoever you want to. Just give me your business card and your email address afterwards or just an email address and a name. Um, you'll also get the opportunity. I wrote a book for board members in particular called 21 Ways That, uh, it's a little ebook. 21 Ways Board Members Can Get Involved and Engaged in Their Nonprofits Fundraising. How many of you would like to have your board members get more engaged? In fundraising, yeah. The studies show, and I'm really glad, most of you are board members, and all the employers were like, I'm not gonna raise my hand, I don't wanna be embarrassed. Uh, the studies show that 75% of nonprofit EDs and executive directors wish their boards were more engaged. The good news is, we as nonprofit folks can teach board members how to get engaged because tens of millions of people don't wake up every morning wondering, how can I be less engaged with something I really care about? We just need to help give them ways. And so this 21 ways can be a way to do that. All right, and now a word from our sponsor. I'm not your ATM. This is your donor. This is on the street corners of Port, uh, street. Uh, I almost could cause an accident in Portland because I, I, I've been talking about this for years. Uh, but we so often treat donors like they're just an ATM. 
We punch money, we push a button, and we expect them to spit out money at us. We don't develop any relationship with them at all. That's why I think 2008 was one of the best things that happened to our nonprofits. I was working at the Hospital, and we were trying to do campaign for pledge fulfillments for Lakewood Continuing Care Center. And one of the things I got to do was calls to business owners saying, look, I know the economy is wonky right now. I used to say I knew the economy was bad, but for some people, the economy was really good when the housing market crashed. It's weird how different markets work. So I said, I know the economy has thrown some people for a loop. If you'd like us to restructure your pledge payments, we can. And we had, I had one person that said, one person in town say, thank you so much, because right now we're just trying to keep people employed. And so my response as a fundraiser who had goals to meet for my nonprofit was saying, Thank you for keeping people employed because without employers paying salaries in our community, we wouldn't have people that in our community. So thank you. It totally built a relationship in a time that was really hard. When you treat people well, unfortunately, you stand out because not a lot of nonprofits are doing this well. So this is a, this little insider secret. Um, we we can you know we stick something in the chamber newsletter and we expect and we get frustrated because there's no not the response we expected. Well. Would you respond to it that way either? Um, I, I was talking to a theater company in, in Lewiston. No, oh, I just outed it, shoot. Uh, it's community little theater, but don't tell them I told you. Um, I was a standing guest at their meetings about 10 years ago, and they wanted, they had, there was this one family that had been really committed to the cause and would be perfect for a planned gift. Um, just asking the whole family to get together and, and just leave some, you know, either donations or some wording in their uh, bequest to help endow a fund. And uh, they, they all sort of, it, I, would as, I was going to make the ask as a volunteer. We went around the board and you could just see everybody chickening out. They're like, looking down, not trying to make eye contact with me. And finally somebody said, what if we sent a general direct mail piece? It was like one of those dear supporter pieces. And if you're ever working for an athletic cause, that's a really particularly bad thing. Um, I've known a lot of, yeah, some of you have made the connection, others watch the replay. Um, but um, it's really, it's, I, they all got excited. You could see their heads pop up around the table. Oh yeah, we could just send a direct mail letter to everybody in our database about planned giving. And I said, what would you do if you got one of those? How long would it be between your mailbox and the trash can? Because it didn't apply to you. We're talking about a woman and a husband and a legacy and a history of support as opposed to just a general direct mail appeal. We can't treat donors like ATMs. So there's what we're gonna to do to make your fundraising the best this coming year. One of the things, everything after this is going to be showing you tactics and tools that whether you're a volunteer or have a large staff, you can put into practice and it will be helping you with, you'll see how it will help with direct mail and with grants and, and I'm, I love major, I love asking people for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just the best, I really do. I, I thought it was a congenital birth defect, but it turns out other people love it too. Um, but uh, this works for grants, it works for corporations, and it works for foundations. So let's look at the, where the money comes from. Every year we've been studying this since World War II. And this is important in thinking about your fundraising for this coming year because you gotta know, if it doesn't it make sense, if you have one customer that's giving you 75% of your business, you kind of pay attention to that customer. Does that make sense for the for-profit? Okay, so let's think of this. This is your four funding streams for your nonprofit in, in North America. You have one that's about 76%, one that's about 8%, I think this one's like 14%, and that one's 4%. Who do you think the big, what do you think the big, it's corporations, foundations, individuals, and bequests. Those are your four streams. Who's the big one? Individuals. Shoot, you guys, did you read the notes? <laughs> if you talk to most board members, they say, well, those are grants. That's government grants or grants or foundations. Um, you know, that's corporations. We gotta go after those sponsorships because those corporations have tons of money. It's not, it's absolutely. Those are, these are individuals, bequests, uh, I don't know why we separate them out, maybe because they're not renewable. <laughs> Once you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> uh, and so maybe that's what it is. Um, so bequests and, and individuals give about 84% of the money given every year. Last year, the, what we have for statistics, the most recent year, $316 billion were given in the United States. 80 to 82% of that was given by individuals. So uh, corporations that are interesting enough, they, they decrease their giving. And many of you that are nonprofits can see that happening. There's different ways you're having to decrease your financial giving. You might be trying to do more volunteering, gifts in kind. There's other ways that corporations are able to give, but cash isn't necessarily one of them. And then um, foundations were consistently around 10 to 14% every year. 
My challenge to you is that why not work your time that way in the coming year? Why not put 70 to 85% of your time into working with individuals, 14% of your time into working with foundations, and then maybe 10% of your time working in corporations. And those of you who do math, you realize it's more than 100%, sorry. <laughs> I love people, and math is a little fuzzy for me, but that's why we have all different skill sets. Um, okay, and then the last thing is, the best part is if you spend your time working in corporations, I mean, if individuals, they run corporations, and the individuals run foundations. When you have a champion on the inside, isn't it easier to get a, f a gift? because you have somebody at the table. When you have somebody on the inside that's excited about you, it's much easier than just filling out a blind computer form, hoping beyond hope that someone's gonna be attracted by the whatever. You have to take your cause and kind of run it through the sausage grinder and hope it fits into what they're looking for. But if you have somebody on the inside saying, no, they're legit, I've seen them, I know what they're doing, it's so much better. All right. So, I promised that there'd be three types of communication. This is the only slide with this on it. This is the condensed form of uh, fundraising 101 that I do for boards, but it's really exciting to know that there's only three types of fundraising communication. Because when you're thinking about your fundraising for the year, it can be just daunting, because you look at all the different tools that you use, but really what you're doing, you're either cultivating a gift, you're soliciting a gift, or you're stewarding a gift. Cultivating a gift means you're educating people, Soliciting means you're asking for something, and I would argue that most all of your communication budget for fundraising should be given toward asking people for something. Um, or, and then stewarding, you're stewarding the gift, thanking them, showing them what a smart person they are for the impact that they've made, making sure that they know that they've done really good things. And what the study is, we're seeing right now that we in the nonprofit sector here in the United States lose, if you took, think about 2014, write down the names of 10 new donors uh, that, that you got in 2014 and take a black Sharpie and cross out seven of those names. Because statistically, seven of those people will never give again. Our retention rate for donors is around 30%. No, and if you tell that to your board members, they will, go, they will start really thinking correctly. Because no customers, no business can be in business if they're losing 70% of their customers on an annual basis. So we need to be investing in stewardship but you know the greatest thing about stewardship communication? If you do it well, you're educating them on why they should give again, because they did such a good job with the first gift, and you guys were so responsible with that, and they're making such a great impact, of course they're gonna to wanna to give again. Um, here's a freebie. I wasn't thinking I'd say this, but with stewardship too, part of stewardship communication is asking well again. Um, what we have, for some reason, we get this weird thing in our heads where we've asked people in our 12-month period, which is whatever our fiscal year is. Most donors think calendar year. Just this shocker, I know, for a lot of us. But if you, if you think about December to January or January to December giving, <laughs> December to January, you think about that three minutes in between the months. <laughs> January to December, you think about the 12 months. We get this weird sense that we're not supposed to ask people for a gift again because they've already qualified by giving our one gift. The studies out of uh, the Indian University and um, a School of Philanthropy and then out of UK with this guy named Adrian Sargent is showing that we need to ask people again within the first 90 days. Once they've made a gift, we need to show them that they've done such a good job, we need to ask them again, and that actually increases retention. Uh, I was doing a uh, training, I did four trainings in Europe last fall, and one of them was in Stockholm, where I had just come back from a training in Seattle where, uh, with direct mail people. Direct mail, how many times do you think, how many times are you guys generally sending direct mail appeals for your, to your donors? Five? I'm sorry, how many times? How many times? How many times yeah. a year? Yeah. Two, yeah, two, three to four is what I normally hear. The testing it is important. I've heard that it, the donations go up until the 21st ask. Sending 22 letters, uh, 21 letters in a year actually increases people's income when they test it out. And nobody believes it. I've never worked for an organization that has the guts to do this because we don't want to be a hassle, but we have to be communicating more effectively if we're going to do that. Uh, when I was in Stockholm, there's a one, one organization, everybody was like, ah, we couldn't do that. You're not from Sweden. You don't know what we're talking about. You don't do that. I lived in Sweden for a year, so I do speak Swedish. Swedish. That was, yeah, because if I do the Swedish chef, everybody here gets it, but nobody there gets it. Okay. Here, chicky, chicky, chicky. Okay, Muppet, that was my Muppet impersonation. Um, they said, but one of the people in that room said they've gotten up to 11 solicitations in a year and they're not seeing any drop off in donor retention and their inc income is going up. Um, so 
something to test. If you want to make your fundraising the best in 2015, you got to, we are not our best donor. None of us sitting, at, no donor decision should be made based on the committee that's making the letter or making the decisions for the plan. It should always be tested on the donor's behavior. If you're not testing what, how your donor's responding to solicitations, then you're losing money. You're leaving money on the table for your cause. And most of us can't afford to do that. All right. As we're doing this, one of the things that I feel like we learn from our mistakes a lot better than we learn from our successes. So before I tell you how to be successful, let me tell you how to not be successful. Um, a few years ago, it's, it's oh good, we get, we're good on time. A few years ago, my wife sent me in to get a box of Cheez-Its. Now, <laughs> right? So I, I, I'm the kind of guy that for 15 years of marriage, I, whenever I asked, she asked me for ice cream, I'd go into the ice cream aisle and I'd see ice cream with Caramel in it. And it was like a prize inside of the cereal box. Caramel in your ice cream. Ha! Ah, not only is it great, it's ice cream, but there's caramel in it. So I'd bring it home and I'd be with my prize inside thing saying, Here, dear, I get the ice cream. And she'd look at me like I was an idiot, because I was. And I, I still don't like ice, I don't, still don't like caramel, Mark. You know, we've been married 15 years. When are you going to value? <laughs> she told me early in my career, she said, If I were an alum, you'd remember this. <laughs> if I were a donor, you wouldn't forget this. Why are you? Yeah, she's, I married well. So, so here she sends me out to do this really innocuous thing. Could you go get a box of Cheez-Its? Sure. I'm a fairly smart guy. I have a master's. I get called around the world. I go there, and this is just a section of the, of the grocery store shelf. It's daunting. Um, I didn't, I, I just got bamboozled. I didn't know what to look. You know, it's gobsmacked. I smacked my gob. That's, it's an it's a Irish term, I guess. Gobsmacked. Oh. Um, I was not going to pull out my cell phone and call my wife and say, dear, I'm still an idiot, and I didn't know there were so many choices, and I really don't pay attention to your cheese at choices, because I'll try anything. I like trying things, but not everybody in my family like, that I'm married to likes that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't get Time Warner, so she won't see that. Um, so, uh, but it, uh, so the cheese that's here, uh, we do this to our donors. When we send out a letter, we'll often put in our response device, would you like to give $5, $10, $15, $25, $100, $2,000, dollars $2, $2, $2, $2, $2, $2, $2, $2, $2, would you like to learn about estate giving? Oh, you've already given us in your estate plan. Would you like to refer a friend? Could we have your email? Could we have your... You've sent the letter to them. Why are you asking them for their address again? Duh. If you've gotten it to them once, why not just spray it in on the response form and make it easier for them? We, what we need to do as fundraisers is remove every barrier from giving. It's, it, it, we know the action we want to take, and then we need to look to see what are the roadblocks we're putting in the way. If we're causing them to fill in the address that they already have on the letter, that's a roadblock that's going to deter them from giving. So this is a roadblock, too. What we, studies, we live in an exciting time. People are doing actual studies on fundraising. When I got into fundraising 20 plus years ago, it was, well, I wrote, used a blue pen and had good success, so you should use a blue pen too. And people have created entire systems on this. There's one that's a, a fundraising system for fundraising events. She had a good event and she's rolled it out for decades now to other organizations and it works really well. But we live at a time now where there's, a, there's actual testing going on by economists. And there's neurology, neuro, neuroscience is happening, and sociological studies that are happening. One of the things that they're showing with this type of choice is it shuts down our, our, our brains. When we're given too many options, we decide not to decide. That's our decision. We just throw it away or we shovel it and put it off for later. Do you know why? None of us want to look stupid. <laughs> we don't want to make the wrong choice. So what we need to do is we like choice, but not too much. So it sh the, the studies are showing that three to four options are good. And that's why you'll see in a lot of response devices, small, medium, and large, like in a, a fast food restaurant, and then in other column. Because honestly, donors are going to write in other anyway. And here's another free, ch free tip. Um, when I was doing fundraising here in town, when you export your mailings, those of you that are direct mail people will get this, and the rest of you just don't worry, I'm not gonna stay here for the rest of the next half hour. But, and you're doing your export for your direct mail piece, you can segment your donors, and you can have them spray in the ask amount. So the donors that gave like 100 to $500 can get a special giving option, but the donors that gave 25 to $50 can get a smaller giving option. Uh, just so you know, and if you have questions about that, you can ask me after. Turns out, I chickened out. 
I didn't know what to get her. So I got, um, I got the plane because I knew that was safe. And then there's, I don't think I see it in here, but the Colby Jack is really good. And if you don't, is it in here? Okay. And if you don't want your kids eating it, try the, the hot spicy Tabasco ones because it totally freaks them out. They think it's a regular Cheez-It. <laughs> But it's not. It's like having it's like having Moxie in your fridge. Yeah, you know, when in the dorm room at college, I'd have Moxie, and people would drink it just once. <laughs> the rest was mine. All right, let's talk, let's talk about all your communication and put all of the stuff you're doing, whether it's events or or writing letters or talking to donors, into the step that the steps that I use in Ask Without Fear, because if you're just doing cultivation, stewardship, solicitation, and stewardship. You're missing an important step. So that's why I use the term get real. I'm a Gen Xer. I heard get real growing up a lot. So the R stands for research. The E stands for engage. The A stands for ask. And then the L, I'm fairly in touch with my feminine side, but uh, the L stands for love. But you know, you can't always love your donors. Sometimes you have to like them. And sometimes you don't even, can't even do that. But none of us live in communities large enough where we can just flush people out of our system. We need to sometimes live with the people that are around us, even if we don't like them. You know, if you go to a sales training, how many people here have been to some sort of sales seminar? All right, you can see the guys like, my, I remember I, I grew up, my parents uh, and I were in Amway when I was a teenager. So I grew up in like uh, going to seminars and uh, great education, but I saw some wacky things. Um, and one of the wacky things was this guy with a hard hat and a sound chip, even in the 80s. Um, and he'd say, sales is just a numbers game. You gotta put names in the hopper and then you gotta kind of move on. And if, if they say no, you just gotta go flush that chip, flush them right out and move right on. We can't do that in fundraising because we don't flush anybody out. There are, always, there are people that will say no to you now that in six months or 12 months or 18 months won't say no to you. In fact, um, I'll tell you, I'll end with a story of a guy that took $40,000 back from an organization I was working with and 18 months later because he was angry. But because we put some of these principles in place, 18 months later he gave half a million. No's are rarely no's forever. Although we have to treat them like that, we can still treat people like humans and they'll come around if, we, if they see that we handle their no well and respect them as an individual. All right, so let's go through each step quickly. Researching. If I were to ask you, don't show your hands, I don't wanna out anybody here. If I were to ask you right now, how much are you trying to raise this year? Could you give me a hard number? How much is your nonprofit trying to raise? Most, most people, when I asked this, I had one guy who ran two nonprofits and was opening a third one overseas, called me for coaching. So he was looking for me to do the executive coaching. And I asked him, well, so what are you trying to raise this year? It took him 20 minutes to land the plane. He had no idea. Because he had government grants and there are other things and, there, and it, he legitimately had a lot to think about but it took him 20 minutes. I had a friend who was invited. She too isn't great with numbers and, and details. She likes big picture and vision. Uh, and she runs this thing for, there's a, a, some sort of screening that can happen for babies and there. It'll find out a birth defect in babies' hearts. And her sister died of this because the screening wasn't done. So she's got this nonprofit to help this screening happen. She was invited to fly to Europe and talk about her program. Now, for most of us, if we get invited to fly to Europe to talk about a program, you're going to read to see who's doing the inviting. She didn't. Um, she just went over there. She gave her program. And fortunately, she'd been doing her taxes the week before because the group said, it was a small group, a smaller group than she expected. And she, they said, so how much is it going to cost to do that screening program in Iraq? And because she'd been doing her taxes the week before, she was able to say, well, it cost $17,000 plus a stipend for myself, and we could start this summer. And they said, awesome, we will have the check in your mailbox before you get back home uh, when you fly out tonight, we'll, we'll wire you the money. It turns out they're a venture capital group or venture philanthropist group that we're trying to look for causes to give to. Can you imagine if she said, well, I'm not really sure, let me get back to you next week? Their enthusiasm would have been gone and they wouldn't have responded. So we need to research our goals. Now we don't want to get stuck here, but to do it well, one way to do it is a case statement. How many people here have written a case statement before? All right, back when I was starting in fundraising, we, case statements were all the rage. You had to do it and then you had to get it published really nice with glossy photos and really good. The problem with case statements when they're published is that they're out of date as soon as they're published. All of us are, our fundraising is a moving target and all of our programs are changing. Um, I just called Tanya through Facebook today. 
I didn't know I could do that. I had my cell phone out. I didn't realize that I was calling her through Facebook. So, I mean, things are changing on our phones, let alone in our programs. So we, there, it's, we don't want to get stuck in a case statement. But what a case statement can help do is that you can list out all the programs that you're doing. Write it all out. Get all the statistics. When I was doing Hospice for Southern Maine fundraising, <laughs> it was a $3 million campaign for Hospice of Southern Maine. The consultants left after $2 million and brought me in to do the last million. <laughs> do you know what that means? Any of you that have done the fundraising? All the cream has been skimmed off the top. <laughs> it's just a hard slog for the last. But we did it. We did it in about eight months. Um, but one of the things that we had in our case statement was formula, actual mathematical formula from the federal government because we knew one of the objections was going to be, well, isn't the government paying for hospice care? And so we told why it was wrong then and why it's wrong even more now with end-of-life care the way it's progressed over the, the decades. So you can write that out. And start tagging dollar amounts with that too so that you start figuring out what the costs are for your program. Um, then you can put it, so the case statement, the way to think about this is what would it cost to run, if you had, not, not what would it cost? If you were brought into a court of law and you had to argue for the veracity of making a gift to you, what would you say? If you had to, the judge said, you need to prove to me that this is worthwhile to give to and you need to prove to this jury, what would you throw in there? Throw it all. It's like a, it's like a, kind of like a, a text garbage pail. You just throw everything in there you could think of, head and heart, you know, stats and, and, and emotional stories. And as you're creating the dollar amount, start, you, you know, one of the big questions we all have is, how do I know how much to ask people? General rule of thumb, people don't get offended by being asked too much if they're asked well. If you just kind of push the button and expect them to give out money, then they're going to get angry. But if you ask too much, I've worn some coffee <laughs> uh, when I've asked somebody for $100,000 and they go, what? <laughs> what financials are you looking at? I wish I were that flush. But they, were, they tend to be flattered. And I've talked to people all over the world and for decades now. They tend to be flattered when they're over asked. So I would aim higher in your ask than you're thinking. Um, but one of the ways to figure out, uh, because we've been studying this since World War II, is using something like a gift range calculator. I've set this one up at giftrangecalculator.com. It's completely free. Blackbot has one that's got the other side of it, of the, the formula. So one of the things, I'll just quickly, one of the things that we know is that if you're trying to raise $100,000, your first gift needs to be 20, 10 to 25% of your total goal. Most of us try to think mathematically. $100,000, wow, if we only had 1,000 people to give us $100, we'd be fine. But people aren't mathematical, they're emotional. And what we found in successful campaigns is that people are making lead gifts. There's a few lead gifts and a lot of smaller gifts. So this is the way we can help create a roadmap. Um, I figure if you have to ask 10,000 or 25,000, it's harder. To, it's just as hard to ask either amount, so why not ask 25? The donor may come in at 10, or 20, but if you ask 10, they, I've only been in one campaign where people have doubled their gift um, out of all my campaigns I've been in. So usually people will take your number and go lower, negotiate lower, not negotiate higher. So why not ask higher? Um, and then the next gift needs to be 15%. Uh, the, the next two gifts need to be 10% on mine. I'm gonna just do it more conservatively. Then go to Blackbot and see what the other gifts are. This, and please hear this. If you don't have that 25% donor, don't think you can't do your campaign. You totally can. But this just gives you something to, to, to uh, kind of a roadmap. And what you can use is if you get scared of the ask amount, you can use this in your solicitation. You can print this out and say, well, would you consider a gift and wave your pen over one of the levels? Over this range over here, and you'll have some driving folks that will say, well, is the top one taken yet? I'd like to take that. Well, we can definitely make room for you up there. That would be great. Um, so this, but what this helps funders see, too, is that you're not expecting them to fund the whole thing because that's one of the scary things for donors. They don't want to be on the hook for the whole, the whole bill, usually. All right, so that's just a quick thing on the gift range calculator. Then you can also, after you start doing the gift range calculator, you can start adding names. You'll notice that you need three to five prospects for each gift level to get the gift. That's what we found out. So that means almost 80% rejection in fundraising. Sorry, <laughs> bad news that early, it's not even nine yet. But three to five prospects, but start listing those people out. What I'd love to find is a way to get this as a, a smartphone app. So when a board member says, Obama just raised $150 million in, in a weekend, and I, we gotta raise at least a million to get this stuff done, instead of saying, what are you, nuts? Do you know how much work I have to do just raising what we raise already? Instead of saying that, you can come to them with their smartphone and say, great, let's put it into the calculator. Okay, 100 million, who do we know that could give 250 million? or whatever the amounts would be. And use that enthusiasm to start building a names list. Because without a names list, you're almost dead in the water. 
as you start getting names, you can Google is a great research tool. It's pretty scary how much information out there is public on us and how easily accessible it is through sites like Google or Bing. You can Google the person's name. You gotta be careful. You can Google uh, their name with the quotes. Whatever research you put you, there's paid research tools like Target Analytics, Donor Search, Wealth Engine, those are great too. Whatever research tool you use, be sure that you put yourself through them also because they pull out all sorts of things and not all of them are accurate. I put myself through Wealth Engine Screening about a year ago and forgot that I had been on a national board 15 years ago. But if I were looking at a donor profile, I'd be like, wow, he was on a national board. That wasn't something that we, it was right in our sweet spot of our mission. Um, I had forgotten that. So we have to be careful. There's another one, the, the classic one was we did Target Analytics, which is BlackBot, with a prep school that I was fundraising for on Long Island. And one of the high rated people was the daughter of our database administrator. And it turns out because of the zip code where the, when the database administrator would move to Long Island, she got the house cheap, but over the years it had appreciated. And because of her, the, the value of her address, her daughter who was out of work looked like she was a top prospect for the nonprofit. So you just gotta take it with a grain of salt. Um, so be realistic with this. Research is exciting. You're visioning, you're talking about possibilities, you're looking at all the things that could be done. You're dreaming, you're thinking about the names of people that could help you get it done. You haven't faced any rejection. You haven't raised any money. You haven't moved the ball down the field at all. So don't get stuck here. And what Zig Ziglar talks about is avoiding paralysis by analysis. You, one, of the biggest tri one of the biggest ways for underperforming fundraisers to perform, or executive directors, or board members, is to say, I need just a little bit more information. No, you don't. If you don't ask for money, you're not gonna get money. So it's good to be prepared, and we wanna prepare our volunteers and our staff as well as we can with a little dossier. This is you know, the background, if you're doing major gifts. This is the person, this is how their interaction, the, the history with the organization. This is some of the giving levels, either group levels or dollar amounts, whatever is comfortable for you. But um, you got to get out there and ask, so don't get stuck here. And I guess w the last part is honesty and integrity are the two best fundraising tools in your toolkit. Don't do any investigation stuff that you feel is, bro is crossing your line of integrity. All the stuff that I put up here is within very good industry norms, and there's a lot of ethics and research that's been put into this. But if it feels uncomfortable to you to find somebody's wealth um, in public holdings in their stock portfolio, don't. It doesn't mean you can't raise the money without knowing that. It means you can, there's sophistication that you can use if you do know that. But just your integrity is worth more than any, any amount of money you could get from a donor. So don't violate that. Cool? We're on board? All right, that's just step one. <laughs> that's so much fun. This is the best, as an ex-verbal, I know it's shocking, but I'm a verbal extrovert, and this is my favorite step, um, is engaging. With the don't treat me like an ATM, it's sort of what we're doing, this is overcomes that. What we, um, I, I used to say that we're like, I used to use this story, and then I found out that Seth Godin used this story. How many people have read any books by Seth Godin? Three of you, one of you, two of you, okay. There's a great library in town um, that will have Seth Godin books there if they don't right now, because the library in is here. Um, but Seth Godin's a great marketer, and he tells a story about marketers, but it works for fundraisers too. He said, often, I'll use fundraisers instead of marketers. Often, uh, nonprofits are like a guy who, who wants to get married, but is afraid to talk to women. So he wants to have kids, but he doesn't want to face the rejection of actually talking to a girl. So he just goes to work, and goes home, and goes to work, and goes home and doesn't interact with anybody. And he starts feeling some pressure because he knows his, his biological clock is ticking. Um, and it's like nonprofits. They start feeling some pressure because bills are coming due, things have to get paid. And, but he, so he's got this aspiration. He wants to get this, but he doesn't want to face the rejection. And then have you noticed, I won't say the average age in this room, but have you noticed how parents start talking about their kids' sex life? It's really embarrassing. They say things like, when are you going to give us grandchildren? I, all my friends have grandchildren. Why don't you have grandchildren? Um, and so I'm being a nudge like my dad would be like, well, we have to have sex first, dad. <laughs> Shuts him right up. It's fun. Um, he taught me that because he used to say things like that and brag about it when I was my kid's age. So now it's getting into his face. We have three kids, so he's over that. But they start getting, so the kid, the guy's getting this pressure. He's going to work, coming home, feeling this pressure, not talking to people, women. He's got the parents giving pressure too. And finally, he just, all the pressure just boils over, he runs out, goes down to the nearest pub, turns to the person next to him and says, will you marry me? And then gets offended when the person slaps him or says no. 
And that's like us with our, our generic little appeals or you know posters that we stick in newspapers or whatever. And nobody answers, oh, why didn't anybody respond to us? We didn't get to know them at all. They're human beings, we need to get to know them. So engaging steps are um, a lot. There's a, when I'm doing this with teams, I love to do the disc. How many people have done a disc analysis type thing before? About six of you. It's really easy to do, and if we had more time, I'd have you all stand up, and we'd have extroverts at the front of the room, because extroverts would go here. Introverts in the back of the room, because it's more comfortable. And then we'd have people-centered people and task-centered people. But it's helpful to do this in teams, because you can start seeing, how, oh, that's why you rub me the wrong way. And that's why you're, you, oh, that's a skill set of yours, the fact that you're always not really good with numbers, and you're just kind of like a big cheerleader. Um, these are the things, when we're looking at different people, though, we need to understand that engaging with different people takes different skill sets. For instance, you have a donor that um, is quiet, sends her check every year, and when you have a fundraiser who's more extroverted, fundraisers like to thank donors by having a party. Let's throw a gala, let's put them across stage, let's have them parade, let's give them big you know, ribbons and name stuff and glitter and glam. That's not necessarily what that, if that donor is an introverted, reserved people person, she may just want to quiet tea with the executive director, or a quiet tea with somebody that's being benefited from that, or a tour of the land that's being reclaimed, or seeing the bird released into the wild. So we need to be thinking about how we're crafting things so that they're donor-centered, not just our organization, within our organization's abilities. Face-to-face -face is always the best, because you can see their face, you can hear their voice quality, you can also get their words. It's also the most intensive. Phone is great, because you can hear people's it's tone of voice still, you can hear, and also, you know what's great about the phone? You can call people when they're not at work and leave a voicemail. <laughs> that is awesome, but if you do that, and somebody picks up, please don't do what happened to me last fall. I picked up my phone, and this person, there was a pause, and I thought it was a robocall, and this guy went, oh, I didn't think you were gonna take the call. Not a great way to start your fundraising pitch. <laughs> Just a word to the wise. All right, if you're on the phone, I know, it's shocking. Oh, I can't believe this really happened. I wish, can I record this? It's Maine, I can record it from my end. Um, so just call, if you're doing calls, remember to smile. Um, and if you Google Pittman three phone tips, there's, there's a YouTube video of three phone tips that uh, can be helpful in keeping your phone calls on task. Um, email is great. We've raised, back in 1999 and 2000, we I, I led an initiative that let it raise $100,000 in email to finish the last $7 million of our, our campaign. That was before MailChimp and AWeber and all these other great services were out there. Email is great because it's asynchronous. You don't have to be there when the donor is, but avoid spam. Anything that looks like spam is spam, even if it's not legally spam. So if you're continuing to send stuff just because it's free and easy, you are annoying your donors if it's not pertinent to them, and they can easily delete you or label it spam. And if Google starts seeing enough people say your mail is spam, you'll never get delivered. And I'm not gonna geek out with you anymore, just know there's a real warning. It's a privilege to be in someone's inbox, and we need to treat that well. Um, the only appropriate place for spam, I've been told, is in the can, and even that's debatable. So, um, handwritten notes are great. I was just talking to another speaker on Saturday. He said that he wrote a handwritten note to a multimillionaire uh, after the, who'd given him time uh, at some event, and the millionaire called him up and said, thank you. Do you know the last time I've gotten a handwritten thank you note? Could we get together on a regular basis? So now he's got this mentor in New York City who is nationally acclaimed and best New York Times bestselling author just because he wrote a handwritten thank you note. But you could do that too. You could print out something on your paper and just scrawl a note across the top. Hey, just saw this, awesome, great that there's another chamber event. Whatever it is, you can just, it doesn't have to be really labor intensive, but it can be very meaningful to get in the mail. Now, uh, Seth Godin also wrote a book on web design, and basically web design in about 20 seconds is when you're sitting in front of your computer screen, you're the organ grinder's monkey, and you wanna know where's the banana. So think about all your nonprofit causes and their websites. It, how easy, what's the one thing that they, you want them to do? Yahoo, what's the banana here? What's the one thing they want you to do? Yeah, right? So it used to say, be more romantic, which I think my wife would like, but then it would say, view singles in your area, which would not benefit my marriage at all. Um, and there's all this other stuff going on. But what about Google? What's their banana? Search. There's one thing to do, search. Very good. So look at this. This was one, I, you could tell it's an old picture now. They've since messed it up. But I loved this thing, because what's the banana of movingmountains.org? Donate. 
Donate, donate. donate money here. But it doesn't feel like it's oppressive because it's a little bit airy. And then if you go down, um, we read from left to right in, in English. And so donate money points to help us, which is donating. Points to donate money, which goes down to volunteering and visiting, which is donating Time, very good. And then in the bottom, it has donate with an exclamation mark in the footer and volunteer, which is donating also. The key thing with your website is not only should you make it obvious what you want people to do, but you should also put it in all of your navigation because all the studies show that if you ha people have to click more than twice to get to their credit card information, they stop. They don't make a gift. It drastically drops off. So you want to make it ridiculously easy to give. All right. Then asking, so that gets us to the ask. And we have, awesome, we're gonna be good. Um, the ask, basically, if you did nothing else, you're gonna raise more money in 2015 than you did last year. If you did nothing else but ask more. But can you see if you've researched your cause, you've, you've dreamt about all the different things you do, not just the one thing that's working. I was talking to a group in, in Boston yesterday. They have one cause that's raised them $105 million this year. They're so ecstatic. They've never raised this much money before. But they have to fund 12 other causes. So the one scholarship program is doing well, but there's 12 other things that their organization does. So in the, in the researching, they're trying to figure out, well, how do we tell that story just as well? So you've done your researching, you've figured out who might help you with the cause, your, your suspects, and then you've actually gotten down to some engagement, you started to meet with them, or their demographic. If you can't meet with them and you're doing a lot of direct mail, look at the magazines that your typical donors read. And then this is a Katja Andreessen trick in her book, uh, Robin Hood Marketing. Um, and then take all the magazines that tend to target their demographic or their niche and rip out all the ads and put them up on a wall. And look at the message. What are they? Because the magazine advertisers are spending billions of dollars every year to research their demographic. So what are the messages? What are the values? What are the hot buttons they're trying to push? And what are the things that your nonprofit can help with that? Can you see how much easier it'll be to ask now? It's not a cold call. Even if it's not, okay, so if you called an engaged step, you said, at least I wanted to get together with you for coffee. Um, I would like to tell you about the, the Music Boosters program. <laughs> it would be the other way around. But anyway. Um, and, and Lisa's, all of a sudden, I'm so excited. I find out that Lisa's so excited about the trumpet abilities of certain kids, like my son, and the Waterville Moods of Boosters. Do you see how I plugged that in there? I don't know. OK, thank you. Well, I want to accentuate the fact that I, my son plays trumpet. It's really cool. Um, we're sitting down. We're talking about the Music Boosters program. She's getting excited about it. I didn't set it up as a solicitation. I just said, I want to show you. I want to have coffee. I'm going to be in your area. It's OK at that moment to say, look, I didn't realize you were that excited. Could, could I ask you now, or would it be better if I call you in two weeks and ask you later? You, know, you could even say, what I love to say even more is, I didn't come here to ask you this time. Sets the stage. Part of my job. People aren't idiots. They know what's going on. They know as a nonprofit, you need donations. <laughs> It's not like you're fooling them by just having coffee, okay? Um, and they'll be frustrated. Actually, studies are being done now that show that people are really annoyed when you're just, they think you're wasting their time and your time if you're not eventually pulling the trigger, especially donors of more means. You need to be, they want you to be inviting them in a meaningful way to, to participate and partner. So it, I didn't mean to ask you this, this time, but is it all right if I follow up with you? If I, can I ask you now? Or should I follow up with you in a couple of weeks? A couple of weeks later, if she says, no, let's, let's just have coffee. We're just visiting. I didn't bring my checkbook anyway. Um, rather than saying, that's OK. You can take credit card, too. Um, <laughs> just say, OK, in a couple of weeks, you call up. And it's no longer a cold call. It's, hey, Lisa, as you asked me to do, or as I promised, you're a person of integrity fulfilling on your request. Otherwise, at this point, you figured out what you think is going to be the niche. You think you know where the plug is going to be. The electricity is going to happen. How many people here have asked for people for money, more money than they thought possible, and had the donor's eyes light up with joy? And I'm serious. There's about, OK, there's a few of you. I want that for all of you, because donors really, when you do it well and you realize it's donor and impact, boom, they realize, oh, I can save that kid's life, or I can make those animals more comfortable, or I can conserve that land so it's going to be here for generations. I could feed those people. All of a sudden, who wouldn't want to be part of that? Why haven't you told, where have you been hiding? Why haven't you told me this? That experience happens, and what becomes addicting about fundraising is you don't know if the next ask is going to be fueling that hit. It's really fun. Um, when you set up the phone call, make sure you say uh, it's something that's more than, I just like to have coffee with you. My first three asks were lies. Um, they were just, I would like to, I'm going to be in your area. I wasn't going to be in our area if she said no. 
Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, so what I say now, to be honest, is saying I'm planning on being in your area. My plans might change after the phone call if you're not going <laughs> to meet with me. <laughs> Just a little integrity, but it's important. It goes a long way. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about the support of a project, or I'd like to talk to you more about the, the trails that we're doing. Whatever it is, make sure it gets some hook. One of the best parts of that is when you set up the appointment pro appropriately, they're going to come back to it. If you chicken out and start going blah, 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 like verbal diarrhea all over the place and not wanting to ask the gift, they're going to say, well, now, it, that's really nice, but didn't you come here to talk to me about? Oh, right. And then you can actually get into this. The other thing is, so don't get into the Ask on the Phone unless it's a phone-a-thon. I had somebody ask me, well, I run phone -a Can I get into the Ask on the Phone? Yes. If your whole job is call asking for money on the phone, <laughs> go ahead and do that. But if you're asking for major gifts, don't. Uh, people tend to give more face-to-face -face than they give on the phone. People tend to give more on the phone than they give in a letter, and people tend to give more in a letter than they do in an email. Those are always, you have to test it out for your own organization. But if you're asking for more money, don't get into the Ask over the phone. When you're in the meeting, ask for the full amount. I like to say the thousand dollars, like a thousand dollars amount instead of an eighty-four dollar a month amount. Hey, I'd love to, you to consider a thousand dollars to our program this year. I want them to know that I'm asking them to prioritize their money, and then shut up, fool. <laughs> After you've made the ask, shut up. <laughs> it's, tra sales trainings will say, "He who speaks first loses." It's not that. It's not that at all. It's not win lose. You've just asked somebody to do something that they haven't thought of doing before. You need to respect the individual enough to let them process at their own speed. How will you know when they're done processing? They're going to be the first to talk, <laughs> right? So this is where it's really good to have a cup of coffee uh, or food. If you, I don't like doing asks at restaurants, but it's really nice if they've offered you a cup of water to say yes, because then you can stick something in your mouth. Because This is the scariest part. This is the part where you feel like you're totally you're out of control and you don't know what they're gonna say. Then, if you've made your own gift first, and this is where I love going to boards and saying, you have to make your own gift first, because most board members don't, and I don't know, I don't understand that. But you have to make your own gift first. We have about 6,000 ad impressions, I've been told, coming at us every day. Our internal BSometers are really good. And when people ask, you ask somebody to do something that you haven't contributed to yourself, they know it just intuitively. So it's always best to have your own gift in there. Um, and then whatever they say after that is just making them, you've set them at odds with you, and now you get it on the same side of the table as them. You've just put them in opposition. Will you take this action? And now they're gonna give you reasons generally why they don't either, they say yes. What happens if they say yes really quickly? You didn't ask enough. You didn't ask enough, right. So then calmly and as, as just kind of normally as you can, you say a year for the next three years? I'd like to ask you to give $1,000. Oh, great, yeah, I can do that right now a year for the next three years, and I've had people actually double their gift in this community because of that, thank you. So, other things you can do is print out the board, the chart, you can have uh, monthly giving options, if you say $1,000 a month, you could say, you know, that's only $84, $1,000 $1, a year, it's only $84 a month. That's a cable bill, a cell phone bill. Could you do that for the, isn't this cause worth that in your life? Aren't your kids worth that much to the school? Whatever it is. Um, not that I like guilt, I wouldn't advise it, but it's, it helps people if you start putting it in terms of cell phone bills and cable bills, it can help them too. So then we go through the objections. The biggest, the two biggest ones are don't have money. Good answer is when, when will you? Because people have cash flow things at different times. The other one is giving elsewhere, which is the best. Because if they're generous, then they're going to make a gift again. Um, if they're not interested at this point, the slide says, what are they, comatose? Because <laughs> you've done all this other work to get to them. Um, and then this is the one thing that a bullet that was on the promise. How many times are you supposed to say thank you between asks? Do you know? No, seven. That's what the industry norm is. That doesn't mean you can't ask them again. So what I say is, I had people say I can't ask them for my annual gift because they haven't, I haven't said thank you seven times. What I like to do is create a culture of thank yous. Your whole donor stewardship, your newsletter no longer is about your nonprofit, it's about how great donors are and how, what a difference they're making in the world. Those are the do newsletters, and I can show you the studies that are really making a lot of money uh, for their nonprofits. And then you live with their response. Even if they say no now, you respect that and you, you keep in touch with them, and when they're ready again, they'll come back. Um, and like I said, one donor, $40,000 back, we kept them as a human being, 18 months later he gave half a million. There. I just totally verbally processed with you. I, this is, these tools are real. The best part is this is the stuff that will help you raise $10 or $10 million. It's the same tools. Um, and like I said, I wanna give you the slides, so if you wanna give me the, your 
uh, your email address and your name. I'll be able to send these probably later this morning so you can share these with people that you have and go over them. And I'll be around to answer questions too. Thanks so much. This is good. Fundraising is awesome. You ready to do this? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to have you pick three business cards. Not your own. Oh, oh, not my own. Okay. No.